Hello and welcome to the Organic Gardening Podcast. I'm Sarah Brown and I'm joined by Chris Collins and our colleagues here at Garden Organic. We're bringing you tips about how to garden and grow the organic way. Do you know, every month I get excited about what we're about to share with you, but this month seems particularly packed with goodies. First, you may have just noticed the COP26 talks going on. Well, we've invited writer and gardener Kim Stoddart to share her thoughts on gardening and growing in this time of climate change and climate emergency, giving you practical actions to help mitigate the climate impact. Then our special guest is a specialist in bees. Chris spent time with Jean Vernon, author and bee champion, and discovered more than he ever knew about these tiny but important creatures. If you threatened a bumblebee, they will give you a warning, a bit like a dog, you know, curling its lip. They'll put their leg up. It's not a high five, it's a back off. Finally, in our popular post bag, we discuss garlic planting and what to do with all the spent soil from your summer growing pots and containers. But before we get started, I'd like to thank our sponsors, the Organic Gardening Catalogue. Why not check out their catalogue online at organiccatalogue.com. You'll find a range of organic gardening products from seeds and plants to equipment. It's the perfect place to look for a whole range of Christmas gifts for the gardener in your life. That's organiccatalogue.com. And if you're a member of Garden Organic, you'll get 10% off. Now, let's meet Chris in the potting shed. Hey, Chris, how lovely to see you again. Hi, Sarah, how are you? I'm fine, thank you. I'm fine. The sun is shining. Believe it or not, it's November, but I've got roses in flower. I've got nasturtiums mm. climbing up. You know, it is bizarre, isn't it? Yes, yeah, it's, it's not quite hit winter. It certainly hasn't here in London. The trees are just starting to turn now. But I just, oh, yeah, we said this last time, I love this time of year. There's a, I love the freshness of the mornings, you know, the dew and all this sort of stuff. Okay, so give us a speedy roundup of what you're up to this month on your allotment and on your balcony. Sure. Well, it's um, interesting because I watched the hours I've had to put in on my allotment go down. You know, I'm used to being out there quite a lot whenever I get spare time, really. But there's quite a bit less to do. I have to resist the urge to be over tidy, I think, is my big issue at the moment. Yeah. I like it. I just want to put it in order, put it to bed. And I think as an organic gardener, you need to you need to sort of question that a little bit. Obviously, there's my compost bins are full. I've taken a lot of stuff out of the ground and they're all in there. I have a big herbaceous border down one side. Um, I will resist the temptation to cut that down and make it neat. It's brilliant habitat for overwintering, for spiders, all this kind of full of spiders' webs at the moment. Um, and it also, the, the head of the herbaceous plants will protect the root balls as well come the spring. So there's a, 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 a horticultural reason not to attack it, environmental and horticultural. I think if I've got a few sensitive plants, I've got some cannas that I'm really attached to, not a native, not necessarily a bridge sort of setting, but I really like these plants. Um, I will probably put a little bit of um, bracken or a little bit of leaf mold around their roots just to protect from heavy frosts. Not usually a problem in North London, but if you're up north and you've got a sensitive plant, maybe protect them this time of year. I think the big temptation I have to resist, Sarah, being an old Parks boy, as I really want to dig a <laughs> lot, <laughs> and I just do, and I and obviously now I have this, you know, this organic approach, and I know that that, that, that the, the soil digs itself. You've got worms to do this. You've got all these, all this whole ecosystem going on. But it does not stop me looking at it going, oh, I loved it. Just for the physical exercise and the enjoyment. But I shall resist. I shall resist. Yeah, hold I need to, yeah, yeah. Uh, That's great. And I really like the fact that you've referenced that you don't want to be too tidy, because I think that is absolutely key. We need to leave these lovely little nooks and crannies, piles of tufty grasses, maybe some logs or some twigs or piles of leaves. These are so important for the wildlife to, to, to overwinter. They're going into hibernation as well. So if you've got a pile of leaves, I bet the beetles will crawl underneath it in the hope that they won't be predated by the birds or the spiders. So it's that sort of thoughtfulness that you're doing for the environment. And then those creatures, they'll reward you in the spring by being on hand to control those early pests. So it's a kind of win-win for both of you. As you know, the organic grower shares their plot with their wildlife. Also, it's very important that if you dig in, you want to dig, if, you, if you're going to do that kind of thing, clear everything, then you're actually damaging growing ability because it, what happens is the rains will come, the winds will come, the nutrients will leach through. You're actually exposing that soil. So you might look tidy in your head, but you're actually creating much more difficult circumstances for your horticulture, your gardening in the future. Which leads us on to that point about don't put down your homemade compost now. Now is 
completely the wrong time to do that on your soil because, as you say, the winter rains will come and all the nutrients will wash out. It's a waste, frankly, of your precious homemade compost. It's not good to have bare soil, and we touched on this last month. So if you've got some fallen leaves, if you've even got some leaf mold, maybe some straw, something organic matter that you can put over the bare soil, it acts like a kind of duvet. It'll keep your soil warm and protected over the winter. And then come the spring, you can either clear it away or leave it there to be incorporated by the soil life and added to by your own homemade compost. But just don't do it now. Wouldn't you agree, Chris? Absolutely. I, I think that compost is your it is your gold. It is your gold of your of your gardening technique. So make sure you use it wisely. And the one tidy job I will be doing is I think I'll be looking at my greenhouse because it needs a clear out. There's spent tomato plants still in pots. I think it needs a bit of care and attention. So I'm going to tidy out the shelves and then I'm going to wash out those empty plastic pots so that they're ready and clean for next year's growing. And I think it's a good thing to do over the winter because it will prevent diseases and pests like red spider mite overwintering. It also means I'll check underneath them for any snails that think they might like to stay the winter there. But I think it's greenhouse or your polytunnel or even just the cold frame. I guess your balcony, Chris. These are areas where you can actually be a little bit tidy. Yeah, I think so. And it's also important, you know, on a bigger scale, if you're washing your pots out, we have a lot of plastic pots. It means they're definitely being recycled. They're not just going, they're old into the bin. So you kind of, you keep the stock you've got rather than bringing in more. I think that's quite important too. And I think you're right about certainly snails because if you leave stacks of unattended pots somewhere, you will get snail (laughs) snail Mm. city without a doubt. Yeah. Mm. And talking of frosts, I haven't seen one yet, but I guess they've had some up north and certainly up in Scotland. And you never know, November can bring and should bring those first frosts. So just be wary. Watch the weather forecast like a hawk because frost usually happens overnight when we're all tucked up in bed and if you've got tender plants then just take care to protect them i've sometimes gone out with a cardboard box something as simple as that and put it over a plant just to keep the airborne frost off it you've got other tips you've got other ways of dealing with frost haven't you chris i do have sensitive plants i do have canners i also have a tree fern i'll even protect the the crown of the tree fern if if i thought it was going to be a cold winter by actually strawing it down and then tying it up so you've got it all closed together um anything tender Definitely look at protecting the crown, the actual crown, the centre of it, and the root ball. If it's perennial, the crown. If it's a base, it's the root ball. Make sure you cover those areas and it will get through the winter. Great. Well, like you, I'm not spending so much time outside in the garden. I'm actually doing some sowing indoors. I'm taking your tip, Chris, and I'm using old margarine pots and mushroom trays and getting some peat-free seed sowing compost. And I'm sowing some lovely salads. Yes, that keeps going. The mini allotment idea is uh, <laughs> it's just brilliant. I love it. So you've got these microgreens and they, they'll go right through the winter. Winter. they'll be a bit slower january february december now we're coming into the dark sort of proper dark month but you'll still get them going you really will definitely so those uh, microgreens in particularly i've really got into baby beetroot and baby radish seeds um, ah. they're really particularly spicy and really light up a sandwich so i will turn my my attention inside for things like that house plants as well this is a time of year i look at them do i want to mix them up pop them together move them around i've got a lot of house plants so i'm kind of eyeing them a bit i will be determined to keep gardening in any form i can long days or short days aside <laughs> yeah i'm with you there okay chris so let's discuss plant of the month your favorite bit of the podcast i know what's your plant <laughs> this month well i'm gonna go for a good old British native this time. I'm going to go for Acer Campestri or the Fee Maple. Um, you'll find this in hedgerows quite a lot, particularly in the south, although it does go further up north. This is a native plant and it's beautiful for birds. Birds love to nest in it. You mix it up with hawthorn, maybe some blackthorn, you get a very native hedge. I've mentioned it because it does this beautiful yellow flush in this time of the autumn. And then you get a very beautiful green flush in the spring, but it's quite a thick, dense crowned maple if you let it go as a tree or as a hedging subject so it's great for cover for all those small insects small birds through the winter i really really love this plant it's a little bit a bit a bit of plant royalty to me i just something about it i really enjoy and it's uh, obviously because it's a local plant a british plant it's also good for our wildlife ah what a lovely idea do you think it would work in a small garden chris absolutely it will take quite heavy clipping because you can use it as a hedge 
So you can, if you had it a freestanding tree, it doesn't really get more than three or four metres width and height. But it, oh, And actually, if you fed and watered it properly during the summer months, I reckon you'd get away with growing it in a container even. But it is a hedgerow subject. So the farmers would come along it when it's a hedge and cut the hedge quite heavily in late winter. It takes that and comes back again. So yeah, it's a resilient plant. Oh, wow. Okay, so that's field maple with those gorgeous yellow leaves this time of year. Fabulous. Thanks, Chris. Okay, I'm going to change the subject a bit now, Chris, so don't go away. I guess you, like many of us, have been following the COP26 discussions. I don't know about you, but I find it difficult to prioritise what I, as an individual, can do in the face of such a difficult and overwhelming scenario as climate emergency, and what we gardeners can do. I thought it would help if we brought in Kim, who's written a book on the very subject of gardening through climate change. Hi, Kim. Hello, Sarah. And you're in Mid Wales in a beautiful rural setting. Tell me, Kim, have you noticed any changes in your growing climate? I have, absolutely. I moved to the uh, the Wild West from a very cosy south-facing garden in Brighton to a spot very exposed to the elements, 700 foot above sea level. So I've experienced extreme drought where my private water supply has run almost completely dry and I've not been able to water my plants much. I've had flooding, my whole garden area flooded entirely. And again, multifarious storm systems, just much, much greater extremes of weather, wow. which has led me onto the path of experimenting with different things that you can do to help mitigate that. You're the best person then, Kim, to give us some practical tips. I mean, when I first moved to this, this much larger area, I've got 2.3 acre small holding, and it is beautiful. So I did all the, the traditional root rule following to start with. I got a propagator and planted in rows. And what I found, I think mainly through the garden for free blog that I did for the Guardian back in 2013 was I tried to garden without buying anything in and what that did from making my own compost seed saving um, making seed compost and just trying to make do with materials I had to hand it really built my confidence and ability to think this is what makes sense to me. This is what I need to do. And I think really with all the practical hands-on advice that you can do with dealing with greater extremes of weather, actually building resilience in yourself as the gardener is actually very much at the top of the pile. That's a good point. So in terms of what you can actually do, I would say that taking even small actions, I mean, all of this can seem very, very overwhelming. We've got the perfect storm of climate change and other things happening in society, and it can feel very overwhelming and quite depressing, actually. The more you can actually build an instinctive, innate ability to, to think for yourself, which is what gardeners used to have before we always used to buy everything in, gardeners have much more of the ability to think, well, actually, why don't I try this? Very much a strong dose of John Seymour make, mend and do. So things like, for example, not buying in gardening tools all the time, reducing the amount of things you're buying in, taking this idea of single use plastic and turning on its head by, for example, reusing pots, just trying to work with things that would otherwise go to landfill and turning them into something useful. It's incredibly empowering. And composting, home composting making is a hugely important part of this as well. What best way to feel that you're actually, it's within your control to make a difference, to turn waste materials into something fantastic for your veg, veg plot. I couldn't agree with you more, Kim. I read somewhere the other day that each individual compost bin stops 125 kilograms of green waste from having to be transported away. Now, green waste is a good scheme, but think of the transport involved. If you can make compost in your own area, your allotment, your garden or whatever, think how much of that carbon footprint you're reducing. Absolutely. And it all makes a big difference. Biodiversity is also incredibly important. So encouraging the natural world in, which is a very important part of organic gardening, actually encouraging greater array of, of predators into your space. So, I mean, greater risk of pests and disease are one of the main threats with climate change, that we will have milder, wetter winters, it's easier for pests to overwinter, and it's a much greater challenge. So the more that you can have natural pest control, the better able you, you know, your plants will be to fare these challenges ahead. So therefore having a greater array of biodiversity is massively important. And it's important overall when it comes to mitigating the challenges for the natural world with these extremes of weather that we're experiencing. That, that's such a good point, Kim, because actually one of the COP26 goals for countries, let alone individuals, is to uh, protect 
the natural habitats, because we know that biodiversity and climate change go hand in hand. You can't deal with one without the other. And by biodiversity, I'm guessing you don't just mean lots of different plants, but actually we're talking about soil life. We're talking about insects, birds, small mammals. I mean, it is diverse in the truest sense of the word, isn't it? It really is. And it's above and below ground. You're absolutely right. The importance of not disturbing soil, no dig, but also just looking even, you know, building up the microbial activity in the soil that actually helps to keep carbon capture related. It helps to keep carbon in soil, but also there are the most amazing symbiotic relationships that can take place below ground with things like mycorrhizal fungi, helping plant roots find water and food. And there's just a whole magical world below ground that we're just really at the tip of the iceberg in understanding. And the more we can build that resilience, the better, the better able our soil will be to help our plants. And it's more enjoyable as well from a well-being perspective. A garden that's full of life is a more enjoyable space in which to be. That's such a good point. Chris, I'm going to bring you in here because Kim mentioned going peat free. And, and I know you're a great advocate of that as well. And you've talked a lot about making your own potting mixes. I think me and Kim would garden very similarly on an open ground situation on allotment. that I garden on a, a height as well on a balcony. And it, that offers up new challenges, as I think, a little way to, to being environmental. and Because I don't have the, the gift of being able to have open soil and treat the soil. But you, there are little things you can do. I have a little compost uh, hot bin on my balcony. It works wonders. I get my banana skins, I chop them up fine, my fruit, my little bit of leftover Sunday dinner because I always make too much. That always goes in. I put a bit of shredded paper in from my office. I've got a little composting area going three floors up. I think your initial reaction is to go out and buy stuff and get bags of compost and put it in. But if you create a circuit, so I now have this relationship between an urban space and my allotment where I bring in composted material that I composted last year back onto my balcony. Then maybe you get into a situation where you're, you're in-house. Is that the right word? You're in-house with your soil care. Yes, and I think you're also following what Kim said about having fewer inputs from garden centres. I mean, it is all too tempting to, to nip out to the garden centre and buy another plant or get some slug pellets or whatever. But almost everything you buy from a garden centre is covered in single use plastic, whether it's potting compost, even bird food. So by becoming more self-sufficient, by reducing and reusing and only then recycling, will we actually help to reduce our own carbon footprint? Well, it's interesting, isn't it? Because are you, on my balcony, is completely full of plastic pots, but I've had them for 25 years. So it's about not getting something and then throwing it away. So the plastics, plastic is fine in certain respects, as long as we're reusing it. So it's about taking care of your resources, not automatically trying to replace them. I think it's important not to go all plastic is evil, actually it can serve a purpose as well. So I think it's all about looking at your space and going, well, I can contribute to the environment rather than take from it, I suppose. I think that's yeah. so true. I'd no need to buy another spade. And it's quite interesting because I bought one of them shiny ones when I was in my last employment job, you know, the, the stainless ones. And I snapped that in half hour. That could be to, to my bad use, but I don't think so. I just think that buy a decent tool, save yourself money, get attached to it. Your, your tools are your friends is a really good gardening motto. They are. Absolutely. It makes you feel really good. So just at the end of the season, round about now, just to do things like to oil your secateurs, to sharpen them again. And they will just keep, you can just keep using them year after year. I was just thinking about, um, also about garden centres. I mean, being from the horticultural industry, I don't, I'm not comfortable with the idea that they're causing masses of problems compared to what else goes on in the world. But it is an opportunity for them as, a, as retailers to address all of this situation. So they can be talking about peat free. They can be talking about reusable cycling. They can, they can be talking about composting, selling compost bins. They can be talking about all of this stuff a lot more. Actually, it's interesting. Horticulture can really lead from the front on this. It really, really could. And I know a lot of people in the game who would agree with me on that. So I think it's kind of like part of us being gardeners is also our relationship with garden centres and what we buy from them and how they support us and how we support them. That's, that's quite important, I think. Yes, I agree with you entirely, Chris, because it, that, that makes us individuals agents of change in our relationship with our garden centres. We can go to them and talk to them and ask for the things that we feel are important, whether it's peat-free compost or not buying bird food in in a plastic bag mm. kim if you were able to do one thing or share one tip with our listeners of what to do in the face of climate emergency what would it be we're all in this together 
I think really is incredibly important thing to bear in mind. And I think that but the more that we can work together, the better that is. So I think that no longer gardening as usual and to can actually connect with other gardeners to share experiences and ideas. Organic gardening really is at the heart of, of the solution with the way forward. But the more that we can work with others and be open to new ideas and also just to reach out and connect so it's natural world it's other people it's our communities it's other gardeners the better that is for person plate and planet overall thanks kim and chris what about you well that's a that's a brilliant answer by the way i, I, I couldn't agree more i think that gardeners are by nature some of the most generous if not the most generous people you meet i looked at my allotment this year i'm a balcony and 95% of it, I think, was seed. So I started off with a handful of something and I ended up with this incredible amount of plants giving me flower, fruit, production, happiness, soul, food, the whole, whole thing. And I think the whole idea, I love the idea, as Kim touched on about, let's swap seeds. That's our communication point. Let's, you grow this, I'll grow this, you do this, you do this. And then we can come back to each other. That whole thing is, is the door opener to the rest of it, I think. We are, ultimately, we are growers of plants. And if the conditions and the way we approach that are changing, then our conversation will enforce that. Thank you. And if I might add a little thought myself, I totally concur with you both that we're all in it together. But I also think the natural world is suffering with all these changes. And I think the more we can do to help protect the biodiversity, to protect those butterflies, bees, to help them adapt by providing shelter, habitat, food, looking after them, I think that is a sing the single most important thing we can do as organic gardeners. Here, here to that. Thank you both. That's been really interesting. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Kim. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. So climate change is with us and our biodiversity is more important than ever. But one little creature in the myriad of our wildlife in our gardens is the busy bee. Chris met bee specialist and author Jean Vernon. Jean often gives talks to children, so we joined the two of them in a classroom to hear more about these fascinating insects. I suppose, Jean, the first place I want to start, what, what made you interested in bees? Why? I mean, it's a hot topic now, but you were kind of ahead of the curve a little bit, weren't you? Yeah, strangely, I suppose I was. I suppose, like most people, you notice that there are bees around, but you're a bit ambivalent about them. And I think for me, the, uh, the turning point, my gateway moment into bees, was my second summer from university. I worked at Kew, at Kew Gardens. In, I know it well, yes. <laughs> in, it was fascinating. I learned a lot. And every lunchtime, I would take my sandwiches out into one of the glass houses. And this particular lunchtime, I think it was raining, I found myself in the alpine house looking at the pretty plants not really knowing what everything was looking at the labels and a gentleman in there turned out to be the curator of, and he started showing me round and he took me to this very insignificant plant growing in the beds and he, anyway to my surprise he took a pencil out of his pocket and he poked it into the flower and said watch this so I peered closely and as he poked the pencil into the flower there was a little pad that came round from the back of the flower and basically bopped the pencil. And he explained that the pad at the beginning of the life cycle of the flower is normally covered in anthers rich with pollen. And when a bee lands and pokes its tongue into the flower to get the nectar, the pad comes round. It either boxes the bee up the bum or between the eyes, depending which way round the bee is. And by doing that, it covers the bee in pollen. And the bee flies off and bees have a, a system, they call it floral constancy, where they visit similar flowers, flowers of the same type. So the bee would leave that plant covered in pollen and it would go to another plant of the same type to feed more. Well, when the pad matures, the anthers die off and then the stick, sticky stigmas, the female parts, are, are on the pad. So the bee, covered in pollen, lands on a different flower, hopefully on a different plant, and the pad comes round, and instead of dipping it in pollen, it picks up the pollen from the body of the bee, and that transfers the pollen from one plant to another, which affords the cross-pollination that all plants want and helps with the biodiversity and the genetic diversity of the population. That, to me, was, well... <laughs> How does that evolve? <laughs> I couldn't believe it. And so this is your, your moment. This then. was my yeah. moment. And 
I didn't at the time really do much with it. It just sat in my memory bank as to, you know, what, what is this weird relationship that some insects have with particular plants? It, it was that that fascinated me. But now, these days, it's not the plants that turn my head, it's the bees. It's, it's the, it's the bees. It's, 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 it's quite interesting because I'm, I'm a gardener, obviously. I've been doing it for a long time and it was always something I took for granted was the fact there are bees. I think we just, they were there and we grew flowers and obviously now we're much more aware of the association. Mm-hmm. So... And, and I think the way gardens going to be a little bit selfish. I'll plant this for bees. I'll plant that for bees. Should it not be the other way around? Should we? Are we? Should we be considering more holistically what makes it friendly for a bee to be in a garden? Yeah, it's more that um, obviously the bees need forage plants. They need plants with pollen and nectar, and they need them. Everyone tells you to have something in flower from February to October, which is really important. But you also need to think about nesting sites. Your use of chemicals and pesticides very relevant with garden organic, of course. Even we weed killers that we think aren't a problem to bees maybe you use a fungicide but bees ferment pollen and they need fungi for that fermentation and by spraying a fungicide on on your plants to get rid of a mildew or something actually does have a knock-on effect that people don't realize to Mm. not just bees but you know to the to the wild creatures the mini bees that live in our garden it's a bigger picture it's an entangled web of creatures and microorganisms and that balance, we need to replace and replenish that balance to have a healthy garden. Bees are part of it. They're pollinating our plants and flowers. They're also food for some creatures and um, it is part of the, the food chain, the life cycle. So I'm quite interested in what you hit on there because people think of bees, they think of the big one that buzzes around in the mm-hmm. garden or the mm-hmm. honeybees are everywhere in, yes. in London, all over the shop. But there's a much more deeper story to the, the to the species of the bee, isn't there? Yes, there is. I mean, a lot of people are amazed because there are actually 275, maybe 276 wow. species of bees in the UK. <laughs> But of those, we have one honeybee, the only bee in the UK that makes honey as we know it. We have about 24 bumblebees, of which you would find maybe seven or eight in your garden if you have a good biodiversity in your garden. And then we have something like 250 solitary bee species. Wow, so most of the bees that are there, we don't see, do we? When we talk about a shared space, they're underneath the immediate zone we think about. Yeah, it's quite surprising. I mean, there's some really fascinating solitary bees. About I think there's about 60 species of mining bees that will nest in the ground. Um, the ones that you might be aware of in, in the autumn, they're the only autumn emerging solitary bee is the ivy bee, and it only feeds on ivy. And when you see lots of them flying low across the ground, it's usually the males which emerge first, waiting for the females to emerge. Uh, Solitary bees are fascinating. I mean, there's so many fascinating things that they do. But um, in in a nest, when you've got a tube that bees lay their eggs in, a solitary bee, and it's the mother bee, the female that does all the work, um, she lays the female eggs at the back of the nest. They're fertilised. And for each egg that she lays, she makes a packed lunch. Wow. And she goes and collects pollen. So she leaves a storage of food for that emerging bee. Yes. So that little bee's got its packed lunch. Well, it's not a bee, it's an egg. Um, So she, she lays the egg... She seals it in with whatever material she uses. So the leaf cutter bees make little cigar packets out of leaves. The mason bees, they use mud. So that's another thing. If you want to encourage mason bees, have a muddy puddle. You know, they need those materials to build their nest. Different bees use different materials. Some use resin, um, some nest in wood. So in the tube, in the insect house, she has the females at the back. And each cell has its packed lunch. And then at the front, she lays the males. Now, they emerge first, which hopefully means they disperse and they don't mate with their sisters, which is important for the gene So distribution is important, is it? But there's also another element, and we don't know if this is why she does it, but if a nest is attacked by a woodpecker or some other predator, it's usually the males at the front of the nest that get eaten. And the precious females are still at the back. So the male is expendable to a certain degree, is it? Yeah, or... I hate to say it quite as <laughs> No, badly, that's fine. But, but that's to fine. a certain extent, yes. <laughs> yeah. Females are the precious cargo at the back of the nest. And it is the females that do all the work. Um, they emerge usually in the spring and then they mate. And then the males carry on drinking nectar and hanging out in the nectar bar and chatting with their mates. And eventually <laughs> they 
pass on, and that meanwhile the female is making her nest. Doing right, work. so she's out doing the proper work, and that is how does that how does that work seasonally? So sometimes you get overwintering complete adult bees in the nest, waiting to emerge in spring, and sometimes they overwinter as you know as an egg. It depends on the species. Right. Different species emerge at different times. Probably any time from from March. You'll get things like the hairy-footed flower bee, which is um, a really quirky little solitary bee um, that you might find if you grow lungwort. It loves lungworts and primulas, and it's very fast-flying. It's like, it looks like a bumblebee, a small one, and the males have feathery legs, and when they mate, the males stroke the females' eyes with their feathery legs. Apparently, that's the thing to do, and um, <laughs> that's why they're called the hairy-footed flower bee. So there's that one. They emerge quite early, um, there's another favourite, which is a mining bee, which I call the panda bee, but the entomologists don't like that. Um, it looks like a panda. It's got black and black stripes, and it's kind of pale grey. Um, it's called Andrina cineraria. The ashy mining bee is its proper common name. That emerges in April. You might find that has nested in your lawn. So they will actually bore into the lawn, just be specific. Ground. If you've got mining bees nesting in your lawn, mm. then you're doing something right, because they like it. They do like closely mown areas of bare soil or sandy soil. If you, if you need to mow, then mow late in the day, after dusk, so that they finish their activity. They will go back into their nest. Look out for little volcano piles of sandy soil. Right. This is quite interesting because there's been a big push for this leave your lawn to grow and a little yes. while. But actually you need both, don't you? Do you do need both. So you need long areas for yes. pollination and yes. bees. But there are other bees that need short grass. Yes. And, and where they are nesting, I mean, sometimes you get um, bees nesting in crumbling mortar. Some of the quirkiest characters in the solitary bee world, there's a, there's a bee that nests in old snail shells. And, That's you know, incredible. When you think. So an abandoned or, or yeah. A, yeah, really. Yeah. Yeah. And, and what a perfect little house for a nest of bees to develop in. It's waterproof. The mother bee, the, the solitary bee, she will she manoeuvres the shells and she put, she weights it with little stones and she manoeuvres it. So if it rains, the rain doesn't go in. Right. And she gets it to just the right angle and then she starts laying her eggs. And again, she provisions each one with its packed lunch. And this bee, my friend Bridget, calls her the pesto bee because she mashes up leaves and she makes her cells out of pesto. That's amazing. So she's chewing vegetation and then regurgitating. Yeah. Is that what she's yeah. doing? Yeah, and then, yeah. So each little egg with its packed lunch has got a pesto barrier around it. <laughs> That's yeah. incredible because that actually that brings me to my next question in many ways. So let's look at what's going on in the garden very closely. So you're saying they could be in the short lawn, they could be in snail shells. Mm -hmm. So they will exist in many, many different nooks and crannies of a garden. Definitely, definitely. In fact, the, the insect houses, I mean, people are really keen on putting insect houses in their garden, and that's great. Um, there is only a small percentage of the solitary bees that will nest in an insect house. Insect houses is a bit of a controversial subject. Some of them are just ornamental. And the tubes aren't really long enough. They aren't always waterproof. And actually, it's essential that they're waterproof because it's not the cold that kills them over the winter. It's the damp. It's the damp. It? Exactly. So you also need to think about the position. They need to be south-facing, if possible. If, if you really want to do it properly, they're expensive. And really, if you can, is put them in a shed or a garage. Don't bring them in the house, <laughs> but put them in somewhere cool and sheltered and dry for the winter. But remember to put them back out in February, March, when the weather improves. Well, this is great information, because I think it's a great... I know lots of people who give that as a present now to mm -hmm. children, mm -hmm. and, you know, it's become popular. But those little snippets of information are gold dust, aren't they? Because then you're going from just something that's hanging on the wall to something that's actually supporting bee life. Yeah. But there's probably only maybe 5 or 10% of the solitary bees that will nest in them because those are the cavity nesting bees. So the leaf cutter bees like mm. them, the mason bees like them. Occasionally you might get the wool carder bee. Now she's fascinating. If you grow uh, lamb's ears, I used to love lamb's yeah, ears. Stackies, yeah, stackies, yeah, the sort of grey yes. downy, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and uh, the males of the wool carder bee. It's very territorial uh -huh. and he will chase off anything else that comes near, even you. It yeah, will yeah. buzz you out. It's got little forks on its bottom and it will poke. It's defensive of it. It's really protection. Yeah, yeah. Because it knows that the females will visit the plant because she wants the fluff. Right. And she shaves the fluff off the leaves to line her nest. 
And so each of her egg, egg cells are like a little woven pocket of wool. So if you were in, if you, this all goes on in a small garden, maybe on a balcony. Yeah. So when I speak about being a gardener, I, I'm deadheading roses and appendix years ago, mm. and I see bees. Actually, I'm only seeing a very small section of what's there available to observe. Yes, yes, because you're seeing them visiting the flowers for pollen or nectar. If it was roses, I, I don't think there are many roses that actually make nectar. They visit for the pollen. Yes. And the pollen is protein. Pollen is really high in protein, which is why it's fed to the babies or the larvae. And the only time that adult bees, and it's usually the females or the queens, they eat pollen to ripen their ovaries. So you're saying there's a big differentiation between nectar and pollen in many ways. Is yes. That, is the, yes. That's quite important for us to know them, isn't it? Is. it? So that's a food source. It is a yeah. food source. Yeah. And the nectar is almost like their energy source. They need the nectar to keep them going because flying uses a lot of energy. So the bees need to replenish that energy. It's a bit like having a can of fizzy pop sugar rush. If you find an ailing bee, the best thing to do is to put it on a, a plant with nectar. Right. Have a look around and see what the bees are on and move it. I've never been stung by a bumblebee. Solitary bees very rarely can sting. So, so that's quite interesting then. So the, the, the sting is a very last resort is what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you, if you threatened a bumblebee accidentally, I don't know, maybe you were picking a flower and it was in the flower and you were crushing it, it would sting you. If you stood on it, it would sting you. But generally, they're not bothered they will give you a warning, a bit like a dog, you know, curling its lip, yeah, you know, a yeah. little growl. They'll put their leg up. It's not a high five, it's a back off. Yeah. So if you're taking a photograph quite close up to a bumblebee and it sticks its leg up... It's telling you to move it's away. It's telling you to buzz <laughs> off. Yeah. yeah. So, so that's quite interesting. So solitary bees are really safe for kids because they don't really sting. I mean, they can slightly nip, but you probably wouldn't notice. Bumblebees can sting, will sting, and don't die when they sting. But it's also only the females of any of them that sting. Males can't sting. Male bumblebees are great fun. They often have a little yellow moustache. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, um, you know, particularly the carder bees, the common carder bee, they're very yellow, the males, and apparently the yellower the moustache, the more sexy they are to the females. <laughs> oh, that old trick. I've tried that in many a <laughs> nightclub, Gina, too. <laughs> So there's lots of little quirky things, and that, that bees have smelly feet, and they and they know when bees they're... have smelly feet. Go on, enlarge me on yeah, that. Yeah, so <laughs> bumblebees have smelly feet, and when they visit a flower, they leave like a little post-it note that says, "I've been here." You know, I've I've eaten. Actually, solitary bees are better pollinators than honeybees. So if you've got an orchard, or you you think you want bees for, to pollinate your crop, you're actually better encouraging the solitary bees and the bumblebees than putting a honeybee hive. Well, that's in. very interesting, because especially the last 10 years, when obviously it's perceived bees are in trouble, that, mm. that pesticides are affecting them, that city urban life is, and all mm. the things humanity mm. does. So sticking a hive on in the corners maybe not necessarily the answer, is what you're saying. Yeah, it's a little bit controversial, but basically, in my opinion, keeping honeybees won't save the bees. <laughs> honeybees are rightly revered. But actually, a kept colony of honeybees are being farmed for their honey, for their wax. The honeybee is the only bee that exists as a colony over winter. Mm. None of the others do that. Its honey is its winter food. So it's fed on its honey, it's kept itself going. But within that colony, there could be, let's say, 30,000 bees. So when the bumblebees and the solitary bees start emerging in March and April, and you've got, let's say, 10,000 honeybees out and there's not much forage around. It's competing with the wild bees. So in many ways, you're saying that if we are excessive in our, our passion for honeybees, we're knocking out other species of bees. Is, we, that, is, that, is that strong enough? Or? Well, we could be. It yeah. certainly puts pressure on, and it is a problem where there are rare bees that are you know, particularly needing a certain type of plant, um, then it can put pressure on. And also when honeybees are kept in um, quantity, several hives together, and it is a problem in London, but also there are some bees are imported from abroad and be, bees can pass on diseases. Speaking as a gardener then, when you say that, if I plant 5,000 lettuce on my allotment, they're more prone to pest and disease. Yes. Is it a similar sort of... Yes. So if I diversify, then I'm getting a mixture of species, that's going to be more beneficial. Yes. Is, that, is that a good way to look at it? Yeah, it's, it's a healthier way. And, and you know, um, one mason bee apparently is, is, does as much pollinating work as 120 honeybees. 
Yeah, that's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. As a gardener, uh, if I have a little space, a balcony or a big garden, what are your big tips, I suppose, I'm asking, to make sure you get this bee diversity in your garden? I think um, grow a variety of different shaped flowers. I think that's important. And then you're catering for bees and and other pollinators with different length tongues. And particularly focus on the February, March and April and also the September and October. And there's also often a June gap, which is quite odd. There seems to be a bit of a dearth of forage. So think of those times as times when you want a good variety of things in flower. Simple things like herb plants, pretty much all of those plants flower. So when you're harvesting a few stems, is leave a few to flower because they're really important plants for pollinators. And there's also some evidence that shows that bumblebees will... They will feed on thyme plants when they have a fungal disease and they will actually seek out medicinal... So it's almost like a chemist, totally. Yes. Really? Yeah. Yeah. So that's fascinating. And that, there's been a little bit of research, but not enough to show that that seems to be happening, that they are self-medicating on our garden herbs. Um, and if you've only got a small area, why not have a, have a pot of mint for your mint tea, let it flower. Have some things that you'll use in the kitchen that you'll enjoy for your cooking that will also feed the bees. I mean, that, to me, is a win-win. And they're not, they're not difficult plants to obtain. No. They're not rare. So you're not having to go into this world of exotic no. gardening to, to be able to achieve this stuff. No. Yeah. And, you know, if you are a gardener and you're lucky enough to have a garden and you've got a few plants that you know are good for the bees, and I do this a lot is I take lots of cuttings and I give them to friends that are interested. They might not be, you know, what I would call real gardeners, but they like plants. And I just think, well, wherever they plant that, that's a stop-off point for, for a few bees, a few pollinators. And if we can join up, if we can spread our love of plants and gardens and wildlife and mini bees, and we can open up people's eyes, even if we don't tell them, they might not like bees, don't tell them it's going to attract bees. <laughs> just plant a plant. Just and... plant <laughs> yeah. a plant and let it flower. I'm going to be a little bit serious now for a minute because there's been a lot of talk of the threat to our bees. What's causing that? What, what, what problems are we presenting to, to, to our bee life? I think it's very complicated. I think the use of pesticides has been a major problem. And unfortunately, a lot of them have persisted in the soil and they've been transferred into plants. The problem with pesticides and plants with respect to bees is bees collect minuscule amounts of nectar and pollen. Well, if you imagine that being concentrated back at the nest, back at the solitary bee, in the packed lunch for the, for the young bees to develop, those pesticides are affecting the fertility. They're affecting the number of queens that are made in a bumblebee nest. They, they have had massive knock-on effects. There's been loads and loads of research. So pesticides is a big problem. And are, even if we stopped using them all tomorrow their persistence in the soil and in the environment is a problem. So they're not a wash-through, are they? You don't no. put them in and they're gone. No. I'm very interested on the soil thing as an organic gardener, so mm. you, you're, you're probably your biggest way to promote bee life is to make sure you're maintaining soil health and it builds up from there. Is, yes. that, is that a good way to look at it? It, it is, because it, 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 we have to understand that the soil is an organism in itself and you know everything that makes up a healthy soil, they then support the plants that feed the bees, of these plants pollinate the plants, they make the seed, the birds eat the seed. It, the whole process is interconnected, so it's no good just looking at each section separately. As a separate entity, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. We have to be doing joined-up thinking in every way. This whole shared space thing is fundamental, isn't it, to mm. organic gardening, to be life and that whole it that is absolutely fundamental and it's interesting you say so it isn't about we love our a lovely basil tasting mint but it's not just about that mint it's how it interacts with the garden is that is that totally, fair yeah, totally totally yeah. you know it is looking at the bigger picture and also looking at weeds in a different way that they're not weeds that they have a purpose going yeah, to yeah. Eat. and the nectar doesn't help the plants Yes, it's only, it's, that's a teasing, isn't it? It's, it's only there. It's it like, is the sweet shop coming. Yeah, 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 here's yeah, the yeah. clickbait. I yeah, want yeah, you know, yeah, come, and, yeah. come and get this yeah. lovely nectar. Uh, there's been some research by Bristol University actually measuring the nectar in different flowers, and they discovered that, this is really fascinating, that one hellebore flower in spring has as much nectar 
there's 157 snowdrops. Wow. So if you've only got a window box, uh, but you really want to do something to help the bees... Then put your hellebore in there. Then plant hellebore. <laughs> Crocus are fantastic bee plants, but not the yellow ones. They like purple. Right. Don't know why, but they like <laughs> purple. So, you know, if you want, again, if you've only got a few pots, then grow purple crocus. And that's a really cheap and effective way to bring Isn't it. Yeah. Isn't yeah. it? That is really not and what, difficult to do. Even though even the most ungreen fingered people can plant a bulb and get it right. Brilliant, brilliant yeah. presents for people. Buy them a packet of crocus. Or, or actually plant them in a pot and give them to them at Christmas. So it's just amazing. I could speak about this all day. I will say, you have a brilliant book out. I don't often plug a book on, a, on the Garden Gate Pond site, but The Secret Lives of Garden Bees is your book. Uh, I know you do a lot of talks and you're out in schools. Yes. Um, I'm, I'm pretty sure you probably have a website. Yeah. And I reckon, I think we've just had a taste, really, of, in your knowledge of, of bees, and I really appreciate your time. Oh, it's been good. fascinating. Uh, thank you very, very much, Jean. Thank you. I'm not normally allowed to talk about bees because I go on to... <laughs> And now it's time for my favourite bit of the podcast, when we open the post bag. I'm joined by Hannah, Anton and Chris. They're all calling in from different parts of the country. Hi, guys. Hello. Hello. Hiya. Hannah, you've got the first question. Yeah, so someone's contacted us and asked whether they're too late to plant garlic. They've never done it before, but would like to try. Anton, can you help us out here? So, yeah, actually, November is a perfect time for planting garlic. Garlic is one of those things that actually needs a cold period. It needs at least 30 days for it to sort of give it that signal to form the cloves. So if you plant it any later than that, let's say if you plant it late January, you might find you end up getting a garlic which has just got one single bulb in it, one great big bulb. So yeah, November is a great time for planting it. And how deep would you plant them, Anton? I would plant them a few inches deep so that the tops of the cloves are just below the surface of the soil. Plant them about six inches apart, um, 12 inches between the rows. And yeah, they should do, do fine like that. I think they tend to do better on a pretty free draining soil. They don't like to sort of sit in heavy moisture. Chris, are you able to grow them in pots on your balcony? I certainly am. Yes, I did. Um, obviously, this is the time of year where I'll be putting a lot of bulbs in. And so I use a variety. I, last year, I used a variety called Music, an organic variety, and it did very well on my pot. I will um, emphasise what Anton just said, is you need a good free-draining loam soil, and they tend to thrive in that. But yeah, there's certainly no reason why you can't grow garlic on your balcony or your you know small back garden. I grew and- elephant garlic last year for the first time, and... It's huge. It's absolutely huge. So I'm guessing you haven't got that on your balcony. No, I haven't. But I, it's amazing. I'll do grow it on the allotment. And you put the whole thing in with your Sunday roast and it goes really soft and almost liquid like. And that is absolutely wonderful. That's my elephant garlic tip. But it's quite an easy uh, plant to grow in many ways. But uh, the cold snap's important. But definitely don't grow it where its feet are going to get too wet. Don't worry. If you go on soggy ground, it will, it will, so, it will toil. <laughs> and can you talk me through the difference between soft neck and hard neck garlic, Anton? Yeah, um, soft neck garlic is the ones that you normally see in the shops, and they tend to store better. I, I guess that's why the shops tend to deal with those ones. I've grown one called Purple White and Germador. They both seem to do pretty well. But the hard neck varieties, I think they're slightly more fun because they produce something called escape. And escape is this funny sort of, it's like the beginning of a flowering structure. It's this great big sort of curly thing that comes up in about May. And it looks a bit like a spring onion. And it's got a sort of funny bulb on the top as well. And in May, you, you want to cut these off because it, it's basically taking the resources away from the bulb. But you can cut them off and you can put them into a, into a salad or you could stir fry them. They're like a really solid spring onion, but with a really strong garlicky taste as well. Absolutely lovely in a salad. I, I mix them in with a bit of sesame oil and ginger into any sort of salad. Great for social distancing as well. No one will want to go near you after you've eaten some of those. (laughs) So you only get those with a hard neck? You can get them in a soft neck occasionally if you stress them out, like if you forget to water them. But but generally, the hard neck varieties which produce them. Okay. And what about using shop-bought garlic? Is there anything to stop you from just taking a normal garlic clove from the supermarket and planting that up? That's a really good question, Hannah. I have actually done that and it has worked. I 
don't think I got particularly good results with it. I think it's also something to be careful about because the garlic that the shops have bought probably has been grown in a different climate, a hotter climate, and it may not adapt well to our own particular local UK growing conditions. And also it just may be carrying diseases, which again, we don't have here and therefore wouldn't be able to fight. So be a little bit wary of that one. Okay, perfect. So yep, get out there, get your garlic planted this month. Brilliant. So our next question um, is a container growing question. Um, Someone's emptying their pots, which had veg and flowers in this summer. And what should they do with the soil, Sarah? Well, that's, again, a good question. I think we need to be clear what the soil is within the pot before we answer it, because if the listener had just bought a bag of potting compost, it's probably completely spent because the potting composts have just they have controlled release fertilizers in them, which last only for a few weeks or so during the plant's growing life. And I'm guessing this is tomatoes, bedding plants or whatever, hanging baskets. These are things that have just grown this year. So I personally would put that on a compost heap. If, however, you've mixed your potting compost with your own homemade compost, you've got a different mix which has got slow release nutrients in it. And that possibly, possibly could be used again. But Chris, what do you think about that? Well, it's just quite a large operation for me at this time of year because obviously all my bedding and my tomatoes, my seasonal uh, edibles are all coming have all come out. And so I'm left with a lot of empty containers that I'm now going to plant bulbs into, organic bulbs. But I've noticed that if the best thing possible policy for me, and I'm up on the third floor, I don't want to replace all the soil, is I tend to replace about a third of it. OK, and I've noticed I left a couple last year where I didn't do that and the results were much uh, lower. And you've already touched on this, Sarah, is what happens is soil leaches, especially in baskets. You're watering them. The, the nutrients are washed through by the water and uh, gradually that that soil will perform less and less. So I just take half out, a third out. I then take that, I take it down to the compost heap on the allotment. So nothing goes to waste. It'll either go into the compost heap or I might use it as a top dress for my more sensitive plants like cannas. I've got some cannas on the allotment that I love. They'll, it'll go to protect from hard frosts. So everything gets recycled, but that revamping of the containers of the baskets by a third, I will probably chuck in a few comfrey pellets, bocking 14 comfrey pellets as well, means that they'll perform well for another 12 months. Anton, would you take the same approach? Yeah, I would. I mean, basically, if something's been growing, something like a tomato all season, it's been hammered, really. It's had most, the tomato's taken up a lot of those nutrients as, as well. So it's, it's not going to have too much left in it. And I think the best thing I, I do is either add it to my compost heap or I do use it as a mulch on sort of various flower beds as well. It's still got plenty of organic matter in, which will just help to benefit the soil. So it's the nutrients that stop you from just using the same soil in the same part over and over again. It's the lack of nutrients, yeah. Yeah. And that the, the soil structure tends to deplete as well over time. So you need to replace it. OK, that's really useful. Thank you. Um, So on to our last question, and it's a composting question. It's one that comes up regularly, I would say. So someone's asked us, when I'm tidying up dead and diseased plants, I never know what's safe to put on the compost heap. Can you help? Anton, I think you're the man for this. Okay, so this one is not quite such a simple answer, because some diseases are able to survive in your compost heap. They form resting spores, whereas others will only survive on living plant material. So they probably won't survive the composting process. However, if you're in doubt, then the best thing to do is really to put them in your green waste collection for the council, because they will put that in an industrial composting operation, which will heat up to high temperatures and will definitely kill off those diseases. I've generally found you look on the internet and you find quite a lot of conflicting answers to these sort of questions. Yeah, if in doubt, it's probably better not to contaminate your compost with possibility of getting diseases in there. So can we perhaps we can run through some of the most common diseases that people are likely to have in their back garden? Powdery mildew on courgettes, what would you do with that? Generally, that needs living material to survive on it, so it won't survive in your compost. So I'd actually put that in, that'd be fine. Okay, Uh, tomatoes with blight. So blight's an interesting one, because again, blight actually needs living material to survive on. So putting tomatoes leaves in your compost, all the leaves will die off and the blight won't survive. Potato blight, if you've got blighted tubers, 
think about it, they are actually living materials. So you wouldn't want to put those in your in your compost. The blight could survive. And how about rose black spots? That's a bit less clear cut. It survives on plant debris and also in sort of stem bud materials. So really, I'd be a bit doubtful about whether that would be killed off in the composting process. And I would put that in my council bin. And yellow brassica leaves, what would you do with them? Well, basically, they are just ageing those those leaves. They're just sort of gradually dying off. So they should be fine. They should be fine to put in your compost, no problem. Okay. Hannah, can I add a little bit there? Just a little tip. I've heard what Anton said, and I think it's very wise words, but I would add whatever you add to your compost heap, it really should be cut up very small because that helps it to rot faster. I always say that... Remember that there's microorganisms and small creatures in your compost bin. There's not a pack of hyenas ready to rip stuff up. Great. Those are our questions for this week. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. See you Thank again you. next month. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye. See you later. So now we've come to the end, and I hope that you too found it a fun and useful episode. If you want to read more about gardening during climate change, try Kim's book, The Climate Change Garden. And don't forget Jean's The Secret Lives of Garden Bees. And if you want to follow up on any of the topics we've discussed, visit the Garden Organic website. There's plenty of growing advice there and you can also find out how to become a member of Garden Organic. We'll support you every step of the way on your organic growing journey. Just go to gardenorganic.org.uk. Next month, we're down on the farm. Not just any farm, it's a wonderful organic farm led by Helen Browning, Chief Executive of the Soil Association. So get your wellies on. And finally, my thanks to the Organic Gardening Catalogue for sponsoring us. And to you too for listening. I hope you enjoy whatever November brings in your own growing patch. And thanks to Kevin McLeod for providing the music.